Okay, so not the best of stopping places, but we made it work. Again, general energy equation, not general equation, energy, general energy equation, or conservation of energy principle as it is applied to fluid mechanics. Let's talk about that. So, um, basically it comes down to this. We say that um, <clears throat> We look at all the mechanical energy that can come into a fluid system. And, and if we look at it energy per unit mass, we'll say let's look at all of the mechanical work that can come in. That's normally in the form of a pump. This is a little w, by the way. Little w in um, plus what I like to call the barrack energy in. That's P1 over rho 1 in the event that the rows are not the same. So pressure at some point upstream plus any mechanical work going in between the upstream and the downstream point, plus uh, kinetic energy correction factor, alpha 1. Most of the time we'll just assume alpha is equal to 1, but sometimes they'll give you a different value. So that's the kinetic energy times this alpha 1. Right, so it's alpha 1, V1 squared over 2, plus the potential energy, GZ1. So this is all of the mechanical energy into a fluid stream is going to equal all of the mechanical energy coming out of the fluid stream. So that's any work coming out, maybe a turbine or turbine, uh, maybe a paddle wheel, something like that, something pulling, extracting mechanical energy from the flow, uh, plus P2 over rho 2, plus alpha 2 V2 squared over 2, plus GZ2, all of the mechanical energy in is equal to all the mechanical energy out plus the thermal energy lost, E loss. Again, E loss represents the change in what we call the internal energy. Those of you who have had thermodynamics, this is the change in internal energy plus any heat, little q, out. Now, this is normally, this is not how we would normally find this term. We talked in Chapter 8 at length about how do we find this term for pipe flow. Um, <clears throat> we have other models for other situations, but this is what it represents. This represents the thermal loss. So mechanical energy in is equal to mechanical energy out plus the thermal loss. Okay. Um, <clears throat> we can find, uh, again, uh, this can take a number of forms. The, the energy loss, which is this is energy per unit mass, which is the same as length squared per time squared. Those are the dimensions. Um, I can also have what we call the pressure loss. The pressure loss, which is equal to density times the energy loss. Right? So notice from this expression here, if I multiply each term by density, well, if I multiply this term by density, I just get pressure. And the same thing happens if I multiply each of these terms by the density of the fluid, I get a pressure term. So the pressure loss between point 1 and 2 is simply the energy per unit mass loss multiplied by the density. And then uh, there's a quantity we call the head loss. Right? The head loss, which is equal to um, take the energy loss divided by gravity. Again, notice this expression here. If I divide each term by gravity, I get units or dimensions of length. Right? Um, the power, right, let's, let's say that big E dot loss, the rate of energy loss, well that's, if this is energy per unit mass, and I multiply by mass per unit time, so I multiply something that's energy per mass, multiply by mass per time, I get energy per time. Right? Um, same thing with the power input to a pump. The power input to a pump would be the mass flow rate times this little wn that you could find from this expression. So I could rewrite this equation, this entire equation, four different ways. All right, well, three. I, I, this one plus three more. I could multiply each of these terms by density and give pressure terms. I can multiply, or I'm sorry, divide each of these terms by gravity and get head terms. Um, I can multiply the entire equation by m dot and get power terms. And it's the same equation. Which one do you use? I don't know. I don't think it really matters. I think it depends on your situation, what you have, and how you want to think about energy. Okay, so any of those are okay. 
So these are kind of some sub points here. Okay. Hmm. It's conservation of energy principle as applied to fluids with one inlet, one outlet, and again what we call um, steady flow. It's the same assumption we made over here. If we have steady flow where everything's constant with respect to time, then what we're saying is, well, all the mechanical energy in is equal all the mechanical energy out plus the loss. Okay. Otherwise, it's uh, n minus out is equal to change. Right? If the change does, if the change is non-zero, then it's n minus out is equal to change. <clears throat> All right. Uh, the fourth thing we talked about, or at least the fourth thing that I would major topic I would suggest shows up on the exam, is um, the conservation of momentum principle, and I'm. I'm afraid I'm going to mess this up, but I'm going to try to go off memory. That's probably pretty dangerous. Um, I'm going to write this down, and I'll double-check my notes. So be prepared to scribble some things out. Check the next video if I'm, I'm going to do this by memory. Um, but here's the basic idea. Conservation of momentum says that if I look at the momentum change for our system with respect to time, so a system being a collection of mass, Right, so that's all of, if I've got fluid coming through here, then I take a, a group of fluid particles here, right, and I an analyze the momentum of all the fluid particles as they move throughout an entire fluid system, which I can't feasibly do even with the best computers we have today. But what we do know is I can normally measure the change in momentum for a control volume, right, some region in space, maybe a fitting or something like that, okay? So if I, if I just analyze some fixed piping system and not worry about the, the particles, each individual particle's momentum as it moves through, I can focus on this and I can probably quantify this, even if I can't quantify this directly. I can probably quantify this. They're not equal to. I also have to keep track of the momentum change of the mass as it moves through. So this is going to be plus the sum of all of the m dots times the speed at all of the outlets minus the sum for all of the inlets, the, mo the rate of momentum. Right? So m times speed or m times velocity is momentum. Mass times velocity is momentum. This is momentum rate. So this is the, the rate of momentum change into and out of a system. So the total momentum change coming through our control volume, I should say. Right? So if I take the momentum change for the control volume plus the momentum change for all of the mass moving through that control volume, this entire sum represents the change in mass for all of the particles moving through. Okay? Okay, that's, and that's Reynolds' transport theorem, which we talked briefly about in our chapter four. Uh, didn't do a whole lot with it, but this is applied to specifically conservation of momentum. And it works out very well for it. Now, we don't, again, we normally don't keep track of the momentum change for every particle as it moves through. What we instead do is we employ Newton's second law. Newton's second law says that the sum of all forces acting on the system is gonna equal the change in momentum for the system. And we're already saying through Reynolds transport theorem, the change in momentum for the system is equal to this stuff. So what we do is we say, well, if I keep track of how the momentum of the control volume itself changes, and most of the time we want the control volume to be stationary, so most of the time the change in this velocity is zero, so then it doesn't only matter what the change in mass is. Plus, again, the total rate of momentum change from out to in. So add up the rate of all momentum going out of the system and subtract from it the total rate of momentum going into the system. So if I've got multiple inlets, maybe a single outlet, and maybe I've got one m dot v term here and multiple m dot v terms there, that's the reason for the summation. If I've just got, like over here, I've got one inlet, one outlet, no, not necessarily any reason to have 
the summation, so it's just an m dot times the speed. But it's not the speed, it's the velocity, because I've noticed I've put vector hats on all of these. This is a vector equation, where this is a scalar equation, and right? all I'm worried about here is, is the energy coming in or out. Down here, the direction is also important. Is it going in in the positive x direction? Is it going in in the negative x direction? That sign is also going to be accounted for in this expression. Right? So make sure you work some problems. I don't have any examples here. If you've got an example you want me to look at, um, send it to me in an email. Have a rough copy of your solution. Basically answer those timed question type of questions about the question and then, um, and then send me your solution or send me your notes and I can try to point you in the right direction. Right? Um, but ask me, ask me some specifics. I'll be happy to try to help you out. Okay? So conservation of momentum. Again, as I said, this is a vector equation. So normally what we do is we say, well, let's just look in the x direction. And then let's look in the x direction. We say, well, all right, well, the change in um, no, sum of forces in the x direction. All right, so add up all the forces applied to our system in the or control volume in the x direction. That's going to equal the change in momentum in the x direction for our control volume. Excuse me. Normally that is zero, unless the control volume is moving. <clears throat> Plus again the sum of all of the rate of mass times the velocity in the x direction at all the outlets, minus the sum of all the m dots times the velocity in the x direction at all the inlets. And again, this may if this is coming in, the, if this is going out in the negative x direction, you need to apply a negative sign to this term. Same thing here. If it's coming in in the negative x direction, it needs to pick up a negative sign. That'll go with this negative sign. It becomes a positive term, and that comes out in the force balance. Okay. Same thing in the y direction. Right. Some forces add up all the forces in the y direction. That equals the momentum change in the y direction for the control volume with respect to time. Which again, a lot of times we're looking for the, what is the force required to keep the control volume stationary. So most of the time this goes to zero. And not having, I'm not assuming you've had differential equations yet, so that's kind of the common thing that will happen is we'll just simplify it to zero. But if it's not stationary, we've got to do something different. Um, again, the total rate of momentum going out in the y direction minus the total rate of momentum coming uh, in the y direction. <clears throat> okay. All right, what else here? Um, uh -oh. So that sum of forces, it's going to include, right? it's going to include uh, any reaction forces, and most of the time that's what you're looking for is what is the force, what is the reaction force required to keep this object stationary? It might include gauge pressure times the area, right? Gauge pressure um, always in compression. Pressures push. That's what they do. Pressures do not pull on your free body diagram. Pressures will always push, even if that's the opposite direction of flow. If the material's flowing out, the pressure's still pushing in. Pressures always apply a compression force. And then so take your gauge pressure times your area, that gives you a force. Always draw it pushing on your free body diagram. Okay? So again, how do you find sum of forces? Well, just like you did in the statics class. Draw a free body diagram, draw all the forces on it, and then add those up here. Okay? You've not had statics yet. I don't know what you're still doing in this class. You're in the wrong place. There's our stopping place. We'll restart the next video there. Loud pop.